majeure events are now no longer called force majeure, they're called exceptional events. Is that a big difference? No, because actually we've never really had the traditional force majeure approach. There is an important difference though. In the 99 edition, to qualify as a force majeure event, an event had to be exceptional, i.e. unlikely to occur in the first place, and then satisfy four criteria, no longer. Now that second leg, the first leg of, of qualifying for exception has been removed, and they simply have to qualify the four criteria, which is, couldn't have been reasonably anticipated, once arisen, uh, can't be pre reasonably prevented, it's uh, beyond the reasonable control of the party, and um, that uh, it's not a breach by the other party. So it's what we call an open category force majeure. It could be anything, provided it satisfies the criteria. When we talk about EPC contracts and flows and, and schedules, we're going to talk about things like a risk matrix. Most of you know that, or you might hear it. You know, that's just setting out what the risks are. We're going to hear things about flow down, typical. EPC contractor takes risk, he wants to flow the risk down to subcontracts a particular way. Or the co employer wants to build something and has to flow down risk to a contractor. We're going to hear about market, in other words, what is usual. Well, let me tell you a secret, there isn't anything that's usual. That's a project finance term, they'll tell you that's market. Nonsense. Which market? Where? What was built? The risk allocation under an EPC contract is going to be affected by a number of things. First one, jurisdiction there. In my experience, there are certain places in the world where it's much more difficult to negotiate an EPC contract as a contractor than compared to other countries. The first point I want to talk about market-wise is the risk allocation under an EPC contract will depend on um, the parties' negotiating positions, and that might be different from market to market. So there may be contractors, for example, who are very strong in the Ghana market, not too strong in the Kenya market. But they've got a good track record in the Ghana market. They've successfully completed a lot of projects. Then they will have better bargaining power than a contractor who's new to the market and who maybe just wants to get the first contract, the first project under his belt. He's going to feel like he doesn't want to push the employer that hard. The employer might have a preference for a contractor who has um, a good track record in that market and he may therefore be willing to give a more beneficial risk allocation to that particular contractor. How are you going to manage your project successfully? You need to think about the contract, you need to think about the risks, you need to think about the causes of claims. But really, there are five steps in a project, there are five steps for success in a project, whether it's Silverbook or whether it's something else. How you set up the project, whether you're the employer, whether you're the contractor, running the project, managing changes to the project, um, dispute avoidance, which is something that FIDIC in the 2017 form is encouraging, and then if disputes do uh, um, arise, managing them trying to avoid arbitration. It's the last thing that you want to end up with. So you need to think about some of the risks. Possession, if you're the employer, are you able to hand the site over? If you're an employer and you've got a number of contractors, might have a major project, you've got two or three contractors working on different um, parts of the project, how are they going to interface with each other? Who's got the risk of design? Are you going to end up in the position of M.T. Hogard that was um, discussed this morning? Who's responsible for the fact that the employer's requirements, are they accurate or not? Who's responsible for checking that? What does your contract say? Silverbook is probably going to make the contractor responsible for assuming that the employer's requirements are accurate. success on an EPC contract look like? In my opinion, from a contractor's point of view, it's simple. We need to meet the budget. Employers are always worried about that. We need to ensure that the job is built safely because I think that's the fair thing that we have to do. So I think we need to meet the cost. We need to meet the safety requirements, but also employers need jobs delivered on time. And they need jobs delivered on time because cost is king 
and they're borrowing money, so they need a return on that money. Success isn't just measured by the contractor succeeded. My belief on the jobs that I've successfully delivered is that it's a three-way street. It's been a good relationship between the contractor, the consultant, and the employer. And each one of them knows their job, and each one of them respects the other and understands that the other one has got to do something. If you do a good feed, it gives the contractor a much better chance of pricing the job properly. And that's what you want. You don't want uncertainty.